So this interview with Jared Thomas, super exciting. This is the guy that taught me in high school. He's the one that, that set me straight and, and got me off on the right foot in terms of my marching career. Jared is from North Carolina. He has marched with Carolina Crown, Blue Coats, Rhythm X. He has taught at Rhythm X. He has taught at Blue Coats, and he is currently the assistant caption head at the Crossman Drummond Bugle Corps. Jared has also had a lot of success teaching high schools. Lebanon High School, where I graduated from, he has been the director of the ensemble for, I think, six years, where they have won two world championships and are a consistent world-class finalist. I hope that you will enjoy this interview with Jared Thomas. He talks about a lot of important stuff, his own life, how he got to where he is, his philosophies on drumming and auditioning. There's a lot of golden nuggets in here, and I hope that you'll get a lot out of it. Okay, cool. So... Jared Thomas. Um, so you are not from this area. You live in the Dayton area currently. Yes. Will you expand a little on that, like where you grew up, things like that? Sure. Yeah, I'm um, originally born and bred in North Carolina. Uh, Elon, small little town about an hour from Raleigh. Uh, that's where I was born in uh, 1984, glorious year. Uh, and then I basically grew up there, went to college in North Carolina, App State, and then I moved to Ohio in 2009. Okay, so um, okay, so North Carolina. Um, what was your education growing up like? When you were, and when I say education, I mean in terms of marching percussion. So when you, what was your first exposure, and when that came, how did you learn and become the percussion that you are now? Okay, that's a good question. Uh, well, the marching band program I was a part of, it was, I would say it was pretty good, um, but definitely lacking a lot of world class information. I would say, so it was. Pretty much, I didn't know how bad I was until uh, as I got a little older. So I, uh, but not to hate on any anyone, it was just kind of like one of those situations—a smaller band program, but we were doing pretty well. And then I, um, I tried to switch to percussion. Actually, four years. So what did you what did you play before? I was percussion? baritone player. Uh, yeah, <laughs> nice. I, actually, I played trumpet. Played trumpet for about a day, and then the uh, the band director and that was, was in like, high school? "Yeah, oh no, middle school. Sorry, okay. middle school, uh, sixth grade." And then the, I couldn't hit high notes at all. So uh, I didn't really know how to either, <laughs> but couldn't hit high notes, and then he put me on baritone. So I went to baritone, stayed on that for four years, believe it or not, so through my first year of high school. And the whole time I was trying to switch to percussion because all my friends were in it. And I just like drums. You know, I, I started playing drum set in seventh grade or so, and then I was like, I want to be in the drum line. It's cool. It's awesome. Um, and they always said no because there was always a ton of percussionists. So I was like, awesome, so I'm just going to not play percussion for a while. And then finally after my freshman year, after doing marching band for the first time, essentially uh, on baritone, I was able to switch to uh, bass drum for the indoor line, and then we folded. So then it kind of just segued into the snare drum. But uh, so I kind of had the the desire to want to be in percussion in the drum line. I started seeing more drum line stuff, obviously in high school. So by the time I got to my freshman year, that was when the first kind of encounter was seeing drum line actually. And I was like, man, I really want to do that now. So my my desire to want to be in it had just exploded essentially at that point so and of course he said no the band director said no so I, I started uh, on baritone again or I finished my last year on baritone and I was determined to get off of uh, to get off of uh, that instrument and get into the drumline world whatever however I needed to and uh, so as I saw the drumline for the first time the the big moment I had was walking into the band room and seeing 2000 cadets on VHS that the drumline that did it yeah, well, it was the drum. It was just the drum course show, and that again at this point, like I knew percussion. I wanted to be in percussion, which you know, in middle school, it's essentially the bells and just right. snare, you know, concert percussion. And then I saw drumline, and I was like, "Ooh, that's fun!" In high school, and then I saw the DCI VHS of 2000 finals, which I VHS. believe was in, yeah, on VHS, nice and beautiful quality. Um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, but it was uh, 2000. I believe it was in Maryland. Uh, DCI finals and I never got to obviously go yet but at this point I just saw it or walked in the band room I was like what is this this is so cool I just saw people in you know uniforms it looked like professional level marching band essentially uh, without winds and I was just kind of or woodwinds and I was just kind of taking it all in and I saw the drum line and all the drum features in that show and I was like I have to do that so that's when there was no looking back at that point it was kind of like I'm gonna switch to drum line I'm gonna do whatever I can and fortunately my band director allowed me to audition for the uh or I was allowed to audition for the indoor line. It folded, and then I just started playing snare drum pretty much obsessively after that moment on my own. And then I started basically going towards YouTube. So I was, uh, well, not even YouTube necessarily, I guess it was kind of online a little bit. The resource or the, the information online was very limited at the time. Right. 
So uh, that kind of essentially kick-started my, the, the drum core phase for me where I learned what it was and then I started just asking the next questions like when has this happened, where is it happening, and then that's what planned the following summer of 01, which is when I went to drum core shows for the first time. And then I went to DCI finals in 01 in Buffalo, New York for the first time ever. Oh, and wow. I just stayed in the lot and watched drum lines and I videotaped. And, and then in 2002, I started videotaping obsessively. That's when I started going to all the Carolina Crown shows that were local around the Winston-Salem, uh, Charlotte, Nightbeat area. And then I would just videotape the snare lines for hours. I mean, I, have, I remember just probably doing two, they used to do long subs too, like in the lot before the full warm up. So I remember I had like probably four to five hours of snare line footage. That of you the shot all yourself? Of Crown snare line, yes. O2, the O2 Crown Jeez. snare line was like the one that, that was the summer where I was just videotaping a lot. Um, in 2001, uh, the, the first DCI uh, finals actual experience I had, I didn't go inside the shows. I just was in the lot watching drum lines and I notoriously remember seeing uh, Glassman 01, which is really, really good. Uh, one of my favorite drum lines actually. And then Blue Devils, of course, I saw BD for the first time and that's when I saw Roger Carter, long haired dude. And I just remember seeing them, they were all so cool and chill and I just videotaped drum lines and just watched the finals lots and it was just, you know, so, so it just kept getting better from there. With, with all the, the things <laughs> you took, um, I guess, so when you started to prepare for mm -hmm. auditions, how did you know what to do? Like, did you have someone helping you or were you just watching this footage and like Dude, getting it's, the nuggets of information you could from it? It's really bad uh, looking back on it now, but um, I mean, I was essentially really self-taught. I mean, again, like I mentioned it briefly earlier, but my, I wouldn't say the, ex the, the knowledge that I have now or the experience that people are being taught the way they're being taught now, uh, I don't think I got that fully in high school. I definitely got the ins and outs like, you know, the basic stuff, but nothing that pushed me in the way that I know how to do things now. So uh, mainly it was from those videotapes. Like I would get home from that show of three hours of footage and I would hook it up to my parents' computer or, or TV and I would get on my pad and I would just play along and watch how their hands moved and I had to literally figure it all wow. out on my own. That's amazing. Yeah, essentially. I mean, yeah, I was taught some things in high school, but it wasn't as detailed. And then at this point, I was just mirroring what I saw how their arms moved, how they're, and then memorizing all the exercises right. and stuff like that. And then um, as my, as my uh, skill progressed, I guess you could say, I definitely, I definitely got a couple of lessons from a guy named Terry Huss, who I can never, I'll never forget. He was one of the, uh, the first guys who helped me kind of uh, just, one of my first serious lessons, I would say, where he, he, he marched in Glassman 01, actually. Oh, how'd you um, get in contact with this guy? I was in a really, really, bad independent a group i think this is why i was still in high school i think it was my junior year no i think it was yeah i think it was junior year going into the 03 wgi season so i had auditioned for this group about i forgot what city it was it was probably like 30 minutes from my parents house and uh that's where i met mikey thomas who eventually marched with the mexican uh in 2004 he was awesome. He was also an 01 Glassman. So I started getting this connection with all these 01 Glassman and that guys. And was your, your, your first audition was this independent A-line. Yes. What was it called? Uh, hmm. Dude, I don't remember. <laughs> well, because we folded eventually. You didn't even finish the season. We didn't so even finish the season. participated in two seasons that yep. were there. And Terry was, Terry was helping out, and Mikey was also helping out there. And, and Terry was just, he was awesome. He gave me a couple lessons and some pointers on the audition process. And then, um, and then I ended up meeting Mikey, and then me and Mikey both auditioned for the Mex in 04, and we both made it. And um, so then we moved on, and we that's kind of how I developed that relationship with those guys. And that's the first real lesson I had where I was like, I'm terrible. Right, and yeah. this guy, is, he was in class 101, literally. Like, I remember watching them and just being obsessed with how good they were and, like, and really impressed and inspired. And then he, um, <clears throat> so he, I was just essentially geeking out, nerding out. Like, I was so excited because I'd never met anyone who would literally been in any of those groups so i just took everything he said very seriously and i was like at that point it just changed and then so then i met terry of course like i said mikey was next um and then that group folded and then they still took us to wgi finals in 03 to so that was watch. my yep and that was my first time really ever uh getting into wgi for the most part I was like i didn't know what that was either so we went to the lot and I got to experience WGI Finals a lot, and that's when I saw Rhythm X, and that's when I saw RCC, and a bunch of all these good groups, and I was like, this is super cool, you know, and that's what I was supposed to be involved in, but we didn't get right. to go, so 
So it was cool seeing that, and then I got to see Rhythm X, and that's when I knew that that would be a really fun group to march, but I just never thought it would be possible because they were eight hours from my, right, yeah, my house. From so that's kind of how that worked. Uh, so that's kind of how my training progressed a little bit from the initial stages was getting kind of lucky and just going to a really, uh, a really a local group, and then I just happened to be taught by someone who was involved in a really good drum line, taught by Colin McNutt and all those guys, and he just made me realize that I was not as good as I thought. Yeah. And, yeah. So then what was – so <clears> – <throat> You went to this independent A audition. So what was your first drum corps audition? <coughs> was it Crown? It was, it was Crown my senior year. Uh, so that and was right after. you made right that drum corps. I did make it. Uh, it, was, it was terrifying. Uh, Terry yeah, tell, gave me... Talk about, talk about that. Well, Terry gave me a lot, of, a lot of feedback, a lot of information on my hands, and just things to think about. And then, um, yeah, so I was auditioning at the time, and I was, remember going back and forth with him about just lessons and... And I walked into the first Crown Camp, and there were 120 snare auditionees that year. Wow. Yeah. And those was like a full room, like a full band room, just packed with snare drummers, all in pads. I remember seeing the App State snare line, which is where I went to college. Uh, I remember seeing the entire snare line. There were seven of them. And, uh, or I mean, I, I'm just assuming there's a lot of them because they all had the same snare drums. They were all sitting next to each other. They all knew each other. And they were all on their pads drumming. I think they were playing the Diddy, actually, which is funny. Uh, but <laughs> <The> crown cam. <laughs> yeah, and they had their like section leader tapping. You know, you know, just like thinking back. I now I think it's dumb, but looking back on it, I know like I was intimidating. Like just walking in and seeing all that, and I was like, "There's only eight snare spots here, probably." You know, and you start to assume that you're just not going to make it. So I was definitely a little bit, a little bit nervous about just seeing that many people. Um, so, and I never didn't know what the process was going to be like. So anyways, I prepared pretty heavily for it, obviously to the best of my ability at the time. And, and shortly we did individuals throughout the whole weekend. It's a pretty standard audition camp. Uh, we got to be evaluated by Jeff Queen. He was one of my first uh, mentors. Um, and my audition went okay. I think, you know, a uh, little nervous drumming in front of the best nerd drummer right. in the world. Uh, so it was kind of uh, a little nerve wracking to say the least. Uh, and I guess I did pretty well. They, they put the groups in the A, B, and C line, and back then they were pretty cutthroat. I mean, as you can imagine, sometimes it's, it's kind of easy to know where you stand when you're in a group full right. of people, or maybe not, but for me, I kind of figured uh, at this point, I got put in the A line, and I, I just started assuming that was good because it seemed like the players that were in there were doing pretty well. And then I, I think we had like maybe 15 or 20 guys, and then I was like one in, I think, on this huge line of snare drummers. And then they just started slowly switching people around. Mm -hmm. And then I just, before I knew it, ended up like right in the middle of this entire group of people. <laughs> so I was like, my confidence was at an all-time high. Like I just felt really like, oh, wow, I'm doing well right now. Yeah. Like I just could feel it. And I was like, cool. And then um, i never forget Alan Joannis. Uh, he was a guy that, he's a, a cadet snare drummer who was on staff there at the time. And they had Palm Pilots. I don't know if you even know what those are. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> yeah. like the old school, just like they used to use those to write notes on and stuff. And he would like come up in front of you and watch you play and just be like, he would just like basically <laughs> rip on you right in front of your face. So he wasn't afraid to put you uh, in your place, which I appreciate now, obviously. But I remember he pulled me off to the side and he was like, man, we're really impressed with you. But if you can't learn to play, and I'm putting this nicely, uh, he said other words, but it was basically if you can't learn to play these grids forwards backwards and off the left we're going to cut you and you have a month to do that and i was like <laughs> okay oh my gosh so so that camp was very eye-opening like yes i did well on paper or i guess yes i did well in that scenario with all the snare drummers like it ended up the field was cut in half immediately and it was basically down to 25 people within the first weekend it felt it felt that way um but so even though i did really well i left that camp terrified because I, I now or terrified excited like I don't know, inspired, you know, you could throw all the emotions into one. It was definitely all of the above, but I knew I had a lot of work to do. Like it, it just it seemed like every camp I would go to, I would break down because you, they would always find a way to, to get you, right. uh, which was definitely humbling. And I needed that because I was definitely at the time, probably the best, I was definitely the best drummer in my high school. I think at the time I rose up through the ranks pretty quick because I just practiced more than everyone else. And I was just very motivated to get good and be, I was basically obsessed with videos and just watching people drum and like just getting it figured out on my own. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, after that, um, I just kept going back to the camps. I kept getting callback after callback after callback after callback. And each weekend it was, or each camp it was the most stressful. It just got more and more stressful. Uh, every camp I would go to, uh, new people would be at. 
so I was starting to get a little bit of the a little bit of insight to how you know I don't know I don't know how the protocol worked but there would just be different guys who would show up every camp that I've never seen before that were coming from either other cores or or whatever so the audition essentially just kept getting more and more intense as it started getting narrowed down um, and at each camp presented its own problems so they would throw some random stuff at you that you've never done before and this is embarrassing but humbling now but I didn't know what 421 grid was right, yeah. had no idea what that was so I'd be like killing a camp and then they'd be like all right we're gonna do 421 I'm like I don't know what that is <laughs> and like everyone else would just know what it is like all these Texas guys were like know what all this stuff was and because this is right after Paul Rennick had got the job at Phantom Regiment. So Paul Rennick had just been at Crown for all these years. And then when I auditioned, he had just went to Phantom. And Jeff Queen just became caption head. So we had a lot of Texas guys who were still auditioning. And um, we did a lot of the similar exercises that Paul, mm. Paul or Paul's groups like to play. So I guess 4 to one was just a thing. And I was like literally learning it on the spot, like trying not to freak out. And I would start breaking. And I would get moved out. And then I, you, you're... You're just, your confidence is smashed in a million pieces, and I thought he was going to get cut. And then they would just say the same thing, like, man, we want you to come back. We want you to come back. And then, long story short, I was at April camp, still not offered a contract. So I've been to... how many people had contracts at that point? I think every spot was set except for the last one, and I'm duking it out literally with one other person at this point. It's like, I think it was down to two people, me and this other guy. And, uh, yeah, so I was like, and even this side story... uh, got in a car accident on the way home from this camp because I got no sleep. It was the same weekend as prom. So I'm like, <laughs> literally went to prom, got up early, drove to camp with my friend who ended up making the court. He ended up being a blue double trumpet player. Also, Michael Sheets out. It's awesome. Uh, and then uh, he, we got, we had pretty, no, pretty much no sleep. So we stayed up all night from prom, got in the car, drove all the way to crown camp. I'm auditioning. And how the far most, did that drive for you? It was probably over two and a half hours and I'm exhausted. Right. And I have, I'm about to have the most exhausting, like stressful audition of my life. This is it. Like this is the, this is the last one for sure. Like we were learning drill at the time, so we're like subbing in and out, like learning drill. And I come off, he would go in, and then Jeff Queen was like, "Follow me." I was like, "Oh boy, here we go," you know. So he like brings us over to this field, and he was like, "I want you to march across the field, crabbing, playing four two one triplet timing." So you know, just the right by myself. I'm like the guy, the guy's watching, Jeff's watching, and he, I go first, and he's like, "Okay." And you do. I thought I did pretty well, but you know, in the moment, you're just, you think it's the worst thing right, ever. I don't know. Yeah. You just think, I mean, it's just a lot of pressure. I mean, I'm 18. I'm like, man. Jeff uh, Queen is staring at you. Jeff <laughs> Queen, like, and Jeff Queen, like, I mean, Jeff Queen is the man. He's like one of the, one of my biggest mentors, obviously, at the time. I mean, he, he was the dude. He is the dude. And I remember just thinking, every time I see him, that guy was on blast, you know, like, yeah. he was an awesome snare drummer. But anyway, so that was nerve wracking in itself at that point, just the pressure in that moment. Like, I've, Man, I've never experienced anything, anything like that. At that, just everything was on the line, and you knew it. So it was like, here we go. So I did it, and I thought I did pretty well. And then the other guy went, and whatever, he's good, it's fine. And then I just thought, I'm just gonna get cut, whatever. Yeah, right. I'm just embracing myself for it. And then he's like, go back to the field, and we went to the field. And then Alan Juan was next to me, and he was like, get out there, you're in it. And I was like, I just wanted to like cry. cry yeah. I just wanted to cry because it had been like. November, December, it had been like six camps and I did not know I was in, you know, it was just every month I never knew. So essentially, the, I think the most humbling part about all that was every time I left the camp, I practiced so much. I mean, at one point I would say my peak, I was doing probably three hours a night, every night, just chopping out, a lot of chopping out and a lot of just skill sets, just working on certain skill sets, depending on what that was with the Met. And I mean, yeah, just like, crazy amounts of hours every week and then every month it was like it just wasn't good enough so it was just really b- breaking down and building up you know if right. that makes sense which was bet and I think that's what they know I needed you know I think that's what Jeff and Alan and you know all those guys that taught there that summer they they saw potential in me I guess and then they just had a good way of making you feel bad to where you were motivated to so I learned a lot from that process that yeah. I still use those tactics if you want right. to I don't know if it's a tactic or it's more like it, they, were, they were correct, you know, I really didn't need that. And I just didn't have that experience in high school. And I feel like a lot of them did. A lot of those guys who made it were well-trained and they had some formal teaching that they knew and were very prepared. And I kind of knew stuff, but nowhere close to the level that I needed to. So right. I learned real quick. Yeah. And so that was probably the, the most growth I had in five months in drumming, without a doubt, was that getting ready for Crown for the summer. So then, okay, so <clears throat> if at all possible, could you quantify 
what your practice routine was like leading up to that camp. Like, how much you practice because this is something <laughs> that a lot of younger players struggle mm-hmm. with a lot. Like being in high school or maybe early years in college, they're trying to balance their normal life, but they know sure. they need to be practicing more. So, what what did that picture look like for you? Well, this is a good question because I know that we know we are both involved in a program where it's a rigorous rehearsal schedule, which a lot of the kids, uh, a lot of groups nowadays are rehearsing three three to four days a week. So we do get that issue of how do you balance schoolwork and life, you know, like how do you still be a person and not right. be locked up in a room drumming all the time. Uh, I, I was pretty social in high school, but I was good at just, I was kind of a night owl, which I think helped me. But uh, I, I would like come home from school, I would eat, I'd go shoot basketball normally, and then I would sometime in the evening I would start practicing and I'd probably do about three hours a night, like no kidding. And that like, started like around when you signed up for this ground trip? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I was drumming a lot like to the videos, like I said, but then everything changed after that first crown camp because right. that was when it was like... The kick in the butt that you needed. The kick in the butt, but also the the reality check and also the potential. Like that's the first like real life glimpse of you may can be in this. Like when Alan Joannis looked at me in the face and, you know, and, cause, and, and Jeff, and they were like, you know, we like you, but you have a lot to do, man. So they didn't give me anything. They just knew that I had to have a lot, I had to be, be a lot more impressive when I came back, a lot more improved in a month. And uh, that's when camps, we didn't set the lines really fast back in the day, at least at Crown, things like that. They would take three to four camps to set drum lines back in the day. And nowadays it's like, you have one shot. Right, yeah. So nowadays it's like, <clears throat> that's a big thing for preparing nowadays is, you have one chance when you go to that camp, essentially to make an impression. So if you're not prepared in the first like five minutes they see you, I mean, I, I audition kids a lot, or students now a lot. So, I mean, you, you, you make a really big impression when you, in the first five minutes. And then of course your individual is a, is a big one, obviously. So uh, back then it was kind of the same essentially, but when you're on the other side, you just don't know what to think. Right. It's like, did they looking at me? What are, so there's so a lot try of to guess what the staff's thinking about you. <laughs> definitely, and I try to tell my students now don't 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 play that game. Like just go in there focused and do what you have to do. Like don't try to worry about what they're thinking about because you're just going to start assuming a lot of things. And of course, I, it's easier for me to say that now. But back in the day, I did the same thing. It was, it's kind of hard not to when you're just being looked at by people. Right. Like they're just they're like you're like a, they're vultures and you're just <laughs> out there just trying to do your best and they're just judging everything you're doing. So there's a lot of pressure, but. Um, so yeah, I would say that that, that kind of uh, shaped my practice routine heavily was just, I mean, that, that moment, getting told that from Alan, like, we like you a lot, you, we can maybe see you in this, but if you can't do these things, you're not going to be in it, we're going to cut you. And I was like, whoa. So <coughs> that made me go home and learn 4 two, one on everything, essentially, um, and grids, forwards, backwards, off the left, right. inverted, like, <coughs> I had never done anything like that in my life, so it was very overwhelming, but... Again, like I was practicing three hours a night. So, so that was essentially my daily routine. I tried to really just try to balance the schoolwork first, uh, hang out with friends, family stuff, and then I would just get myself away from distractions when I would go to my practice sessions. And that was how I was um, essentially started out. And then I would do weird things like timing, timing myself when I would play. So if I were working on chopping skills or a certain skill set that I uh, was specifically trying to target, I would try to go for endurance. I was really big on chops. I mean, I, I tell that to my students a lot right. nowadays, but I think it's a huge thing because it just makes drumming easier, in my opinion, and especially on certain certain things. And again, the muscle motion, the memory, like just everything you can get ingrained, the more you do it, I mean, it's just going to get there faster uh, if you're doing it right, which is the key, I guess. So uh, for me, it was, I would start timers with like one to five minutes to 10 minutes to 15 minutes. So I'd be playing rolls for 15 minutes straight at certain tempos, and I'm just trying to be, you know, efficient, uh, consistent and uh, obviously play with the net and things like that and I think that doing that for so long every single night that's what got me to that level it's just it was just a copious amount of playing in a short amount of time right. and that's what I think a lot of people struggle with now and it's true but I think most of it is <clears throat> just distractions in general so if you can get out of distractions you can put your cell phones down you're, you get away from normal things then you're going to get a lot of efficient practicing done. And I think that's one of the biggest things that we face nowadays in the technological world is is just people are very distracted easily. They're not really good at disciplining their time. And back in the day, I was very disciplined at that skill. Like that was, I saw it, I had it in my sight, the finish line was there, I knew it was possible, and then I've never drummed so much in my life from that moment forward, I mean, at that point. 
Um, I don't know if I still have drummed that much. Like I drummed a lot after that, but man, that was that was something else. <laughs> so the audition experience will do that to you if you're open-minded and humble and you realize you take what they say seriously, and yeah. I did. So, so yeah. looking, I mean, your situation was unique for sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, you didn't have like a someone working with you one on one at the time. So no. you look back on your on your high school self, specifically going into that crown camp. What mm -hmm. is like the one piece of information prepared for? Hmm. I would say, I mean, it's so easy to say the packet because that's essentially what most camps start off with. You know, right, like at least, yeah, at least at, at Blue Coats and at Crossman. You know, that's essentially what we do. Like, we'll start off with some legat, like some basic strokes. So, just run it down. Like, essentially, eight, eight, sixteen. Sure. You know, like your your ability to go through the height system, whether that's just, you know, three, six, nine, twelve, fifteen, or whatever, whatever you're trained on. Uh, I like to use more of a protractor idea at, at at least at Lebanon. We've talked a lot about that in the past. But you know, just go through the height, the normal height system with legatos and, and accent tap. Like those are the two biggest skill sets. And I know I said that comment earlier about, I feel like I can see who's gonna make this line just from watching them right. play legatos. Like legatos and accent tap are the two biggest ones to me. Like, and I swear I've got it to 95%. Like I, I can just look at someone play at legatos and accent tap and I can just know almost if that person is gonna even be close to making the group. We hadn't even got to Flam Dragon. We didn't, we, we didn't get to Molar when we were at Coats. Right. Like, we didn't get to anything. It's all exciting. Everyone wants to play the hard stuff. Trust me, like it just doesn't matter. Like if you can't play accent tap, if you can't play legatos, if you can't play low fast legatos, if you can't play at piano with rolls or just just the normal basic stuff, you're you're immediately written off in my mind. Like when I watch someone play, I'm like, that person's gonna have to do a lot of really good things from this point forward to change my mind. And sometimes that does happen, but it's very rare. It's very rare um, in the audition process just because that's, we then evaluate that in your individual and then it just kind of confirms, you know, right. that you have some skill sets that need to be strengthened up a little bit. So, I mean, literally, I played accent tap and legato so much in, in my practice uh, when I was practicing for crown um, and at various tempos, various heights, but essentially I would target large muscle, small muscle groups mainly. So I would be working on endurance of, uh, you know, say tap pyramid style, just really fast, low stuff, uh, building up chops, building up, you know, height control, sound consistency on both hands. And then I would develop large muscle chops, just playing eights as high as I could, vertical for as long as I could. So I'm just going to exhaustion. So kind of view it like uh, going to the gym of drumming, you know. Right. That's essentially how I would always tell students now, like, if you want to get big or if you want to lose weight, you got to put in so much effort. So it's kind of the same thing with the, the muscle development with drumming. And that's what I would uh, say. But so, yeah, I would say legato is an accent tap first thing. And then generically the packet, just people not knowing the packet. And that's what the camp is all about. People want to come to Blue Coats to play those sweet exercises. They want to go to devs to play hard stuff. They want to go to, to Crossman to to play the right. exercises they saw on the lot the summer before. And they skip over the fundamentals? <coughs> oh, absolutely. There's guys that blew my mind this past this past camp. So much talent this year at Crossman, the auditions, like mind blowing. And they would struggle with accent tap and they would just reef through Flam Dragon in their individual. I'm like, hey, you wanna play something fun? They're like, sure. They just ram Flam Dragon down. I'm like, wow, okay. And anything else? And they're like, I can play this snare lick from Blue Devils, whatever, or like, you know, they want to play their own licks. I'm like, sure, play it. And they just ram hard, fast, really fast drags, you know, just flam drag, cheeses. It's all insane. And I'm like, why can't you play accent tap? Right. You know, because that to me is just unbelievable. And I think that's what a lot of generation kids are doing now. There's snare science now, which is awesome. It's a, a nice outlet for people to get a lot of information. And and I think that there's a lot of people that are just learning really hard licks, which I think is cool for sure. But I, I think that if they're not ready for them, I think it, it just it just ruins their fundamentals. And that unfortunately is a, I mean, if, or at least at Crossman, that's something that we highly value. Um, and I don't understand how you can play, you can't play accent tap, you know, efficiently, but you can play a snare right. break from whatever year. I think that's fun and cool, but you know, we have to all be able to drum the same way. And if I, I'm going to have a hard time uh, buying into someone who hasn't who isn't disciplined enough to spend hours breaking down technique on legatos and accent tap and the basic structure thing. So I think it's cool that they've reached out and done a lot of things, but I think that it says a lot about someone who has really good fundamentals in terms of discipline and, and the hours and just maybe the type of person they are, you know. And 
And if you're a person that can't play the basics, I'm gonna question whether you care about them, you know? That, or a caption head, so they're, we're gonna start to question if you value spending time on stuff like that. So we have to trust that when we take these people that they're gonna, they're gonna fix their, their errors and they're gonna fix their, their you know, deficiencies in their playing when they leave the camps, you know? Right. And so when you sign that contract, we're, we're putting a lot of trust in you to, to make these big adjustments. And I want, I mean, and, and speaking for me and Josh, we want to be really sold that you're just a solid player when it comes to the most important things. Cause with there only being essentially four stroke types in drumming, if you can't play accent tap and legatos, then how are you going to play paradiddles really well too? You know, like, I don't know. I, I don't, I, I have a hard time buying into right. it being any sure. other way. So, so that's essentially a big one. So, <laughs> know the packet and spend a lot of time playing legatos and accent tap. I think that's a, the two height, understanding two height technique is so important and there's groups to do it a little differently. So again, that comment I made earlier, you just have to kind of dive into how the group that you're auditioning plays and then you have to spend a lot of time perfecting that and just making sure that it's really solid. So, you know, again, reach out to groups, send videos, see if people will see videos of you playing it like, hey, so-and-so Blue Devils, check out my accent tap video. Would you mind giving me some feedback? Maybe they'll say no. Or maybe Jared Andrews will say, hey, I do offer lessons, and then you can do lessons with him or something, you know? And, and then you get immediate feedback from a guy who literally teaches Blue Devils. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, you, you have more incentive to be better, and you have more information that's gonna directly impact your audition process. So again, that kind of goes back to the last you know, comment we we're talking about, but you know, that preparation starts with the core, the core structure stuff, of course, and then just knowing the packet, and then you branch out from there. So basics, packet, learn a bunch of hard stuff right yeah yeah in that order some way shape or form but it's going to always come back to how your hands look when you play the stuff if, you know so you just got to really be able to break down what skill set you're working on on each hand and then dive in right. okay so this will be the last question um, and we maybe have covered this in some capacity based on the other questions but if you could give one golden nugget of information to <coughs> the community of drummers about what they should know that they may not, what would it be? Hmm. Practice. No, I'm kidding. Um, no, I would say, I, don't know, I think it, it's all about just making the most of what you say you want, you know? So I think that a lot of, ref for me, it's more still, uh, philosophical. I think for me, I've, as I've gotten older and as I teach students now, I, I try to get, to get to them as individuals and see what their true goals are. So I feel like it's important for everyone to sit down with yourself and like write out, like be, get really like reflective on who you are and what your goals are with drumming. Like, why do you want to do this? Like, what inspires you? Is it, do you want to be that guy on the magazine? Do you want to have a great experience with a great drum line, marching in a drum corps, meet a lot of people, have a lot of fun, and then carry that in the indoor and do that, you know, whatever. Like, whatever your goals are, I think you should recognize that and then see the path that you have out in front of you and what that's going to take, you know? Um, and then, so hypothetically, if we have, I want to march, you know, wherever in the top three drum corps, if that's like your main goal, then at that point you have to start taking the other bits of information that I suggested that I think worked great, where you can reach out to people that you may know who march there or who teach there and just ask questions, you know, and then go to an audition, you know, experience that. Um, and then at that point, you just got to be a lot harder on yourself with how much you're practicing, essentially. And I think that people shoot for the moon, essentially, nowadays, and they don't, they don't do that. Their effort they're putting into it doesn't match the goal that they want, if that makes sense. So it's like, I tell this to Lebanon sometimes, too, it's like, you're not, you're not going to get the results that you want if you're not putting the work in, essentially, or one of those type of uh, quotes. But, or this is one of the good one. Like, don't get mad at the results you're not getting from the work you're not doing, you know? So, and I think that's a lot of what I see. There's a lot of kids who are very confident in their abilities, but they're not putting enough work into it, but they just think they deserve things. Like, well, I'm, pretty, I'm the best one in my high school, so I'm gonna go to Crossman and I'm gonna make it. And then all of a sudden, we're cutting 95% of the people there and they can't believe it. They wanna know why they're being cut. And I'm like, well, these are the reasons. Like, one, your, your attitude wasn't great. Uh, you don't know the packet. Right. Your preparation was very, very poor. Um, but we like you as a person, you know, but at the end of the day, we can't take you because we just like you as a person. Like you have to, you're going to have to prove yourself and your worth and your ability to improve. So, <laughs> but I think that's a big one. And, I, and, I, and also when you know where you want to go, I think it helps you lay out a path. 
you know, like I said, and I think that most people just see something they like, or at least if it's drumming, and they just, they, they're seeing a finished product, a finished polished product, right? Like if you go to DCI finals and you watch Crossman or Blue Devils or whoever in the lot, you're seeing a finished product of hard work that these dudes have done thousands of hours all summer, and it's at such a pristine level, and you just want to see yourself in it, and then you just think, I'm going to be in it. Like, I'm going to go home and practice, and I'm just going to be in it. And I think that people sell themselves really short on how much work actually goes into that. So essentially, you got to be practicing really efficiently, which is why I suggest reaching out and not being afraid to ask questions and put yourself out there. And you got to you got to you got to face humility some, you know, and you just got to you got to have people you got to want to fall in love with people telling you you're bad. I think that's weird, but I think that's how I, how I how I grew the most is people just putting me down in a, in a way that I needed to. Like when I went through the mix you know, and Tim Fairbanks taught us there. He he was yeah. really good at he was really good at making me understand I wasn't good enough, you know, in the best way possible. And I remember feeling embarrassed and challenged and motivated and I came back ready to go. And I needed that, you know, despite the fact that I had marched drum corps already and I thought I was really good. Yeah. Um, and then when I left Crown for my second year and I went to Blue Coats and then I was taught by Mike McIntosh, you know, and Tim Maynard, who was in, Tim Maynard was in 2000, uh, the cadet snare line, by the way, old Came story. full circle. Came full circle. Yeah. It's crazy. But, you know, Mike McIntosh, Ray Uliberry, all these guys at, at, at Coates pushed me the same way. And no matter how good you are, there's so much room you have to grow. And I feel like it's easy for, it was easy for me then, and it's easy for students now, and you're surrounded by people that maybe you're better than. You get trapped into thinking that you're good enough. You get trapped into thinking that, you're going to be fine and you're just going to go here and make it and you have this big you know awesome plan mapped out for you but at the end of the day you just got to do more work you got to do more drumming you got to do more investigating where you want to go and and making sure you're really reaching out and drumming with really good people and getting as much information as you can about how your hands look and i think that that's that's just like that that is just crucial like and if i could have gone back like i said earlier i would have I would have gotten so many lessons. I would have reached out to really, really good people who have great reputations and are smart, and I would want them to just tear my hands apart, <laughs> like, <All right. coughs> like stop sugarcoating everything. Like you, and that's why I would do that. And I tell all the auditionees at Crossman, like, thanks for coming out, but please make videos and send them to me. And I'll, I'll accept videos. Like, you don't have to pay me. Like, send me a video, and I will watch it and go, hey, this is great. You're doing much better now. Fix this, this, and this. Check this, and you get information and you grow. You know, so. I feel like people just need to want to grow more. They need to put themselves out there more. They got to not be afraid to be, you know, to face humility a little bit with someone thinking that they're not good enough. Like, uh, you just got to, you got to want to hear the things that maybe you are uncomfortable hearing, yeah, which is you're not good enough or this needs to be better. And you feel like I've just spent hours on this. It's not good enough. Like, but that's the way we grow, you know, like, I mean, some people maybe, yeah, they get really lucky and and they just have natural ability and that, but that's, but that's great, but that's not most people. And uh, you're not gonna ever go wrong, in my opinion, from working hard for something. So <coughs> that's what I would suggest mostly, is just put yourself out there, figure out what, reflect on who you are, what you want to do, and, and really be honest with yourself and how much work that's probably really gonna take. And all these snare drummers who are watching, I mean, DCI is essentially the NFL of marching band you know it's like the top elite level of this activity essentially and what you're going to do so just imagine how many guys and play high school basketball want to be an nba player or nfl they want to go to nfl um, or, or just any professional sport like so many people don't make it like i wish i had the the stats on this football this I think it was football stat <coughs> just from how many kids play high school football to how many get scholarships in college to how many get into the nfl Dude, it is like, it is unbelievable how that, it goes down to like one to 5%, or not even five, it can't be 6%. It may have been 1%. Think of like a one, top 1%, you know? Right. So it's such a small amount of people. And I think when you start to think of things on that grand scale, it starts to make, it made me at least realize, wow, almost no people get to do this activity, at, at least at certain levels, you know? If you're talking top three, so when that one kid said, I want to go be a blue devil, I'm like, you realize... You're talking 1% of snare drummers in the entire world get to do that, you know? And if you're talking just Div 1, what, 12 snare lines that make finals? Well, all Div 1, there's more. But if you think, I want to march finals, you know, on, on Saturday night, that's 12 groups, 
eight to nine snare players a piece. Let's say that's 130 people. 130 people at an entire country of 300 million in the United States, roughly, that get to March DCI right. finals. Something that's very trivial in the world to a lot of people, but super important to people who love that activity. And you want to just go be in that with doing hardly any work. You know what I mean? It's just not going to happen. Of so yeah. I wish people understood how the scope of how hard it is to be there and how much work actually has to happen. And you know, clearly, with your experience, and a lot of people who have clearly been in it know. But even me, as, as hard as I worked, now I wish I would have worked harder. I didn't do enough. You know, so that's why I love teaching now because I get to, we get to have these conversations, you know, and like right. challenge people to look outside your situation, you know, or like reflect on yourself and where you want to go, but realize it is not easy to get to where you want to go, especially if you're trying to go to the top like that or if you want to be in Div 1 or, I don't know. But there's the, the, the cool thing too is there's so many resources for you to go experience it in some way, shape, or form, right? There's like all types of divisions and drum corps you can do. There's so, so many indoor groups you can be a part of, so... But either way, I think having this type of standard will set you apart from all the other people that are auditioning, and it'll make you feel a lot more comfortable and confident in your ability to prepare for auditions and to uh, just have more information going into to these type of uh, situations and experiences, which I think is great. And um, you're going to grow regardless, but definitely the more you know, the more it's going to be a lot more comfortable. So that's what I would say. You know, just got to reach out and learn a ton. Well, Do work. I mean, thank you very much for your time. Yeah. Um, I know that your wealth of experience and knowledge that you just shared is greatly appreciated by yeah. myself, and I'm sure anyone that's going to watch this will get a ton from it. So thank hopefully, you very much. Hopefully. Chop out. Chop out.